Hallelujah. If you would turn with me this morning to the book of John. The book of John chapter 3. Starting in verse 15. The book of John chapter 3. Starting in verse 15. As we were coming up on this day, I began to pray and I was like, God, what do you, what do you want me to, to express to the people? What do you want me to portray to the people? What is the heart of God saying to your people this morning? And he laid his love on, on my heart. You know, sometimes we can hear the words, I love you, expressed. And, but when God expressed his love towards us, he did it with action. He followed up with action by dying on the cross. And so many times we hear this verse. We hear verse John 3, 16. We hear this a lot. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I really began to think about that verse because we hear that verse a lot of the times. It's kind of thrown around in prayers. It's thrown around in everyday life. It's thrown around in Sunday school. But then I began to really think about that verse. And I was like, the whole of the Bible is summed up in that very verse. From the book of Genesis to the book of Revelations and everything in between is summed up in that very verse. If that was the only verse of the whole of the Bible that we have, we could understand what God provided for us through his son. That his love, his love, he sent his son to die for us. And I pray, I know that we hear this. We've probably heard it. We grew up in church. We heard it over and over and over and over again. But I ask this morning that the Lord give us fresh revelation. Yes. Because some of us have been living for the Lord a while. And some of us have just gotten saved. Some of us might not even understand what it truly means to be born again. What it truly means that God gave his only begotten son. That we should not perish but have everlasting life. Maybe we don't understand what that means. And I was talking to Pastor Matt out front. And I said, you know, the Lord laid this verse on my heart. I said, I began to study it, and then I began to see that there's so much depth to this verse that we can uncover. And I pray the Lord help me this morning to do that. If we would start in verse 15, the word of God reads this. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whosoever, let me say this again, whosoever, whosoever, it doesn't matter your background. See, he takes our shame and he turns it into glory. So I don't care what you have done. Paul, the great writer of most of the New Testament, was a murderer of Christians. It really doesn't get much worse than that. And he could be saved. So I don't care what you walked in with this morning. And those of you online, if you are listening, what you have done and where you find yourself in. That, that song said that his grace and mercy will find us on the mountain and will find us in the valley. There is nowhere that God's grace and mercy won't go for his children. He said, you shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. He did not come to condemn. Let me say that again. He did not come to condemn. So many times we have this misperception of God. God is ju he's judge. Yes, he is judge. But he has made a way to make us right and in right standing before him. He didn't want to come and say, Donnie, you are guilty and you are without. You have, there is no way for you to become not guilty. Guilt, con condemnation is a verdict before God. It's a law. It's a verdict. He said, I didn't come to come to condemn you, to put shame on you. 
And I think John, who wrote this book, had a great understanding of what the love of God meant. Four times in the book of John, it says he expresses himself as I am the disciple whom Jesus loved. I would love to say that. I am the disciple. God, reveal your unconditional love to us in such a way that we can walk around even if we blew it right before we came in this door to say, I am. Maybe you got to fight with your spouse. Or your friend. Or maybe somebody cut you off on the road. Or maybe you checked your bank account this morning and it wasn't looking too hot. And you felt some type of way about it. But you said, you know what, I'm going to get up and go to church anyway. Because I am the disciple in whom Jesus loves. Why? Not because we did it all right. Not because we thought it all right. Not because we said it all right. Not because maybe we just bit off. Pastor Larson says this, a big piece of stupid. <laughs> I love that. <clears throat> but because God so loved the world, he gave his son on Calvary that we, as we believe in him, could be in right standing before God. The verdict now, today, upon your life, Nicole, is innocent, not Okay, I won't have you 
and raise your hand. But we can have a real bad attitude and temper. And John and his brother were called the sons of thunder. They needed an attitude check. God, check our attitudes. But I love that when, when Jesus was walking by John and his brother, and he seen them fishing, he didn't see, he seen them, their faults in the song, their failures, and he didn't say, now nah, they ain't gonna work. He said, I see two men that I can work within their eyes. I see what they're going to become and he called them anyway. He called them out of their faults. He called them out of their failures and he said, look, Sabrina, follow me. And you know what they did? Immediately they dropped their nets and they followed him. Immediately they, they dropped their nets and they followed him. Why? Because the Holy Ghost was calling them. See, the Holy Spirit, if you're here this morning, the Holy Spirit is calling you. Yes, he's calling you to be the disciple in whom Jesus loves. And he's saying, look, I know your faults. <laughs> That's okay. I know your failures. That's okay. That's why I died. That's why I gave my son. <clears throat> you don't have to count yourself unworthy. <clears throat> because Jesus said you were worth it when he died on the cross. He said that you were worth it. They were high-spirited, zealous, undisciplined, and constantly misdirected their words. Can I get a witness? But God, he takes ordinary men and women, and he does extraordinary things through their lives so that he could get the glory for it. Hallelujah. The theme of the book of John is faith in Christ is necessary for salvation. I want to drive this home this morning. <clears throat> faith in Jesus Christ <clears throat> is necessary for salvation. Yes. There is no other way. Right. And I, we're going to go into that. Because I feel that a lot of the times we can come into the church house. And we can use words like born again. We can use words like salvation, justification, sanctification, glorification, the rapture. There's all these big terms. Then maybe sometimes we come into the church and some of us do know what they mean. But sometimes we come into the church and we don't know what they mean. Or maybe we only scratch the surface of what they mean. So I want to come and explain to you this morning, one, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why did he give his son? So you, because you need to be born again. I need to be born again. The world needs to be born again. Faith in Christ is necessary for us to be born again. So if you would travel through this story with me, if you would go to John 3, 1. John 3, 1. You must be born again. This is in an imperative. And we can say this. Miss Jackie, Miss Jackie's born again. And we can say, okay, well, I'm born again. And I can come into the church and I could sit down and I could have received Jesus Christ into my heart. But then it just stops there. God wants to do so much more in our lives. He wants us to live victorious in Christ. He wants us to have joy. He wants us to have peace in tribulation. He wants us to be provided for. He wants us to walk in freedom. He wants us to walk in deliverance. He wants us to know who we are in Christ. To know that we are not alone, but that we have a father that cares. There's truths of the gospel, of being born again, of what he wants to reveal in our hearts. There's so much more to being born again than just a ticket to heaven. Amen. It's not just a ticket to heaven. So let's look at this man, Nicodemus. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. 
He was a ruler of the Jews. Nicodemus was the brother of Josephus, who was a great writer of wars. He was one of the three richest men in Jerusalem. One of the three richest men of Jerusalem. He was so rich that it was recorded that he could support all the inhabitants of Jerusalem for 10 years. That's some money. A man that had prestige? See, because he was a Pharisee. And the Pharisee means a separated one. One of the ancient Jewish sect that was distinguished and strict observance of the laws and traditions of the Jews. So he was one you would look at and you would say, that's a godly man. Because he was a Pharisee. He was one that tried to keep the laws and the traditions. But there was still something missing in his heart. He had prestige. He had power. He was one of the members of the Sanhedrin. I'm trying to paint a picture for you. The Sanhedrin was the highest court of justice like the Supreme Council in Jerusalem. That means he had power. Prestige. Money enough to support the inhabitants of Jerusalem for 10 years years. That means in the outward perspective, he wanted for nothing. Not only that, he was known as a godly man. But it says this in the word of God. Verse 2. That same man came to Jesus by night and said unto him, that same man, that same man of power, that same man of prestige, that same man keeping all the rules and laws and regulations to the best of his ability. That same man with all that money that he wanted for nothing. That same man came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, I want you to check this word out, this next word, it's real hard. We, we, there was more than one that was wondering we know that thou art a teacher. They knew something. Thou art a teacher that come from God. They knew that there was something different about Jesus. For no man could do these miracles that thou does except God be with him. It was remarkable that he came to Jesus by night. And I always thought that he might have been afraid. But as I began to study different scholars, they said that not because that there was any danger that may have come in a later period, but because of his own providence, prominence, he didn't want any of the members of the Sanhedrin to be commenting on his pursuit of Jesus. So he came by night. Another scholar says this, that would make him a superficial believer. Because it wasn't about a relationship with Jesus Christ. See, when you are born again, you can't help but be different. <laughs> when you are born again, you can't help because, listen, the Holy Spirit moves up on the inside of your heart. And he will not stop. He is in constant pursuit to change us into the image of God. When we get angry, he will check us and say, oh, shouldn't have said that. You've been, oh, you've been holding on to that unforgiveness? You need to surrender that. Oh, you, you rolled your eyes at her? <laughs> oh, you thought that wrong thought? You better flip by that channel and keep on going. The Holy Ghost will constantly be in pursuit to change us more and more into the image of God when we receive him and we are truly born again. He says, we know that thou art a teacher come from God for no man works these miracles except God be with him. I can only imagine what the Sanhedrin these, these men that proclaimed they are of God. I am of God. And
and they began to hear Jesus turning water into wine. They began to hear that Jesus was in the temple flipping over tables. This Jesus was working miracles and blinded eyes were beginning to be open and deaf ears were beginning to hear and the dead were being raised. The Sanhedrin, the men that were of God, began to hear the miracles that Jesus was doing and the Holy Ghost began to draw Nicodemus out of that place of religious activity and say, there's more, there's more, there's more. And sometimes we can be the same way. We can come to church. We can lift our hands. We can pay our tithes. We can go through all the motions. But God, he's looking for us to do those things out of our love and relationship with him. But look, they, I don't care if you put $1,600,000 in here. We're great, right, Pastor Matt? But it ain't going to get us to heaven. Right. Right. You're good. If you hand out cookies with us on December 5th, we'd love your help. <laughs> but that is not going to get us to heaven. I don't care how many books in the Bible you read and how many prayers we pray. That is not going to get us in right standing with God. There is one way to be right with the Lord, and that is to repent of our sin, to ask for forgiveness, to ask him to come into our hearts and to change directions of our life and begin to believe in what he did on the cross, believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what Nicodemus was missing. He had all the money to give to the church. He had everything he could possibly want, and there was still a void within his life and within his heart that he had to sneak out by day because he didn't want anybody to see him because he was like, I have to know the truth. I've got to know the one that is doing all these miracles. Miracles were the proof that Jesus was who he said he was. It was and he did miracles to encourage our faith. He wanted us to believe. It always points back into believing one thing. John 3, 3 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That verily, verily means this is important. This is emphatic. Listen up. You need to hear what I'm saying to you. You, Jesus said, you must. This is not a, this, you must. You must. It's not something you can just pass by. You must be born again. And if you aren't, you cannot see the kingdom of God. See, he blew past Nicodemus' compliments. He, he wasn't even concerned with him saying, he's a teacher come from God. He said, hold on, I see a soul that is in need. I see a soul that is in need. I see where you're really at, and I must let you know you must be born again. Yes. Amen. Jesus wasn't just calling Nicodemus, because the Jewish people are God's people, but he also brought in the Gentiles. He also brought in us, and he said the whole world, in order to enter into the kingdom, must be born again by the agency of the Holy Spirit. That means that the only way you can be born again is through the Holy Spirit moving on the inside of you. Natural birth had to be followed up with the spiritual birth. And we see this, we see as we begin to understand what born again means. So I do, I want to, I want to go and dig into that word born again, spiritual birth. As I said, we need to repent. We need to surrender. What does repentance mean? It means to turn about face, to go away from that which it was keeping us in bondage and to believe and to receive what God has given us. And not only that, but confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died and rise, rose again. That's what the book of Acts says, in order to be born again. Because when we are born in Adam, 
Adam, we were born in sin. Sin separates us from God. Sin will separate. It won't only separate before you're saved, but if we continue to sin after we're saved, sin will separate us from a relationship with God. If we live in a place of unforgiveness, it will separate you from God. Let me tell you something. Unforgiveness only keeps you in bondage. If they, and we think we're controlling something by not forgiving, well, I'm going to hold on to this and show them. And really, it's just eating you alive. Right. You're not controlling it. It's controlling you. When we want to live in a place of anxiety, and look, anxiety is real. And a real issue. But God wants to deliver us. He wants to deliver us from fear. He wants to deliver us from lust. He wants to deliver us from wrong attitudes and wrong thinking about people and about God and wrong directions. He said, I want you to be born again. And the cross is that which bridges the gap from sinner to saint. As soon as we believe and receive, we can come into a place of being regenerated, formed new. The act of God. By his divine nature of the Holy Spirit taking up residence within your heart and your life. You are become regime. You get a new DNA. You are in a new family. You are now in the family of God. With the Lord being now your father. God wants to give you the keys to the kingdom of God. You are his, just like my dad gave me the keys to his car this morning. The Lord wants you to have the keys to the kingdom and everything in it. Everything in his storehouse is yours. Everything he died for is yours. You must be born again. I wouldn't think that if some stranger walked up to my father this morning and said, can I have the keys to your car? Dad, would you give them the keys to your car? <laughs> no. <laughs> It's the same with our Heavenly Father. See, when we're born again, He knows us. We are now His child. He, he can now bestow His gifts upon us and give to us. But if, if, if someone who has not been born again goes to the Father, He's going to say, I don't know you. I can't give you. You're not my child. And that's not a mean thing. God is saying, look, I gave my son that the whole world, nobody is left out. Every single person can receive salvation through faith and grace. It doesn't matter who you are. And I'm going to give you a new nature. You're no longer going to live and dwell in a place of sin. But I'm going to give you a new power source. You now have power when you are down to get up. You now have power when bondage and temptation come to bring and grip on you again. I am now free from that. Amen. How y'all think I stay free from heroin? No, honestly. I hope you're not, we're not too holy that I can't be raw come in on. here this morning. Be raw, how do you think people stay free from alcohol, from pornography, from fornication, from all these different lusts and things in this world that try to drag us down and cause us to perish? Depression, loneliness, suicide. Look, them kids in there, let me tell you something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip the script for a second. I asked those kids questions, and one of the things one of the kids brought up was he frees us from suicide. Amen. I just want to encourage you right. that these yeah. children's souls hang in the balance of what they see us doing as adults, where they see our lives and our direction going. They are learning, and they know the truth. And I encourage you to continue to bring your children because the world is getting worse. Yes. Yes, it is. From the time that I was growing up till now, it still has totally changed. Yeah. We are being deceptive. 
yourself, you're too holy. I just want to do right by God. I just want to keep his word. I just want to live for him. And God says, I'm going to... I'm not only going to give you a new DNA and a new name, yes, yes. but I'm going to give you the power to live for me in a dark world. Right. In a world that is being consumed yeah. with lust and desire. In a world that's being consumed in darkness. Yeah. Look, if this church ever shuts down, God forbid it ever does, but God wants to prepare his army to be able to stand without gathering together here. Yeah. Right. Can we stand? I think a lot of us were tested during COVID of what that was going to look like. See, not only is the enemy attacking, but God is preparing. He is, the enemy is attacking, but God is preparing. <laughs> and it's a beautiful thing if we can lay hold of what God has given us in the born again experience. You must be born again. Second Peter 14, one, excuse me, Second Peter 1, 4 says this. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these you might be a partaker, a companion, a sharer of the divine nature. And that means that word divine nature means God-like. God wants you, Mike, to be a companion and sharer of his divine nature. Inside of you, reflected in and through your life. He's saying, Mike, I'm going to give you a new power source. The rest of the verse says, having escaped, that means to flee, the corruption that is in the world through lust. He's saying this, look, everything in the world is going to try to pull you away from me. But I have given you a divine in the born again experience to flee Hallelujah. from the lust of this world that will try to shut down your relationship with the Lord say not giving you a new power source through faith in Christ this, this verse right here tells the redemption story of Jesus Christ I love that, that word of redemption because it says the action of regaining or gaining a possession of something in exchange for a payment, clearing a debt. Redemption is the action of regaining or gaining a possession of something in exchange for a payment, clearing a debt. Jesus cleared your debt. All we need to do is exchange our life for his. Amen. It's going to cost us everything. But it's going to, he's going to give us his kingdom in return. It's going to be the best exchange you ever made. I was selling, selling a purse. On the marketplace this lady texted me and she said would you exchange your bag for this bag and I was thinking to myself this is not a good exchange <laughs> <laughs> but the exchange and I said no I reject that exchange but the exchange that you will make with Jesus for the old man to the new will be the best exchange you've ever made in your life. It will be the best decision you've ever made in your life. I wish I had pictures of what I looked like before I got saved. I really do. My mom threw them all out. <laughs> she went upstairs and she rated everything and she threw everything out. So mama I could have used it as a testimony. She's like, I was tired of looking at it. It's like, okay. That, see, but that's what the Lord does. He wipes our slate clean. He says, that's gone. That's gone. There's no more. No need for you to dwell there. No need for you to even look at it anymore. Because that is not who you are any longer. And look, there might be some residue left over. There might be some things that you still got to deal with. But the power that gripped you before broken over your life. And 
morning you choose to know what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. That's good. What does this look like? If you will go with me so we could see the scripture on the board, Manuel, Romans 6, 6. I hope you have your seatbelts on. I'm going to go through this mighty quick. But you got, we got to know. We got to know what we have in Christ. Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, you need to know something. You need to know something, right? You must be born again. Well, what does that look like? How does that look expressed in a believer's life today? We can hear the term, but I want to see what it looks like. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed. I want to tell you this, that word destroyed means entirely idle. To do away with, it now fails. It now loses its power. Amen. It is entirely useless. Amen. It is abolished. It has ceased. Hallelujah. No more can sin destroy you. It has been abolished. It has been destroyed. And henceforth, we shall no longer serve sin. You are no longer a slave Hallelujah. to anxiety. You no longer are a slave to depression. You no longer are a slave to lust and filthy communication. You no longer are a slave to these things any longer. That is an old man. Old ways of thinking, old ways of acting, old ways of doing things, old ways of cheating on our taxes, old ways, old ways. He said this, Colossians 3, 5, God, God stepped all over my toes, so tuck your toes under. He said this, Colossians 3, 5, mortify, mortify, what's that word mortify mean? See, I'm talking to you about what the born again experience gives you. Amen. See, because we can talk all day long, I'm born again, I'm born again. But what does it actually give me? I want to know what I have. He says, mortify, meaning recognize it as a corpse. Miss Angela, are you going to carry a dead corpse around? <laughs> Just drag it behind you? No, that thing's going to be heavy. And not only is it going to be heavy, it's going to be stinky. And not only is it going to be stinky, but then shall be, it will begin to decay you. Because it's decaying. That's it. So when it attaches to you, now you begin to decay. Right, right. That's good right there. He said, look, mortify, recognize it as a corpse. Mortify what? Therefore, your members, which are upon the earth. Uh-oh. Fornication. That means... Indulging in unlawful acts that could be spiritually or physically. Yeah. Yeah. Uncleanness, meaning impurity, physical or moral. That which is not be right before God is unclean. And if you don't know what is right and wrong before God, the Bible lays it out. Amen. That's right. He says, inordinate affections. That means lust that isn't in its proper place. So that, look, we could go to homosexuality here. Now look, the Lord loves, God so loved yes, yes. the world right. that he gave his son. Yes. He does not agree with any sin. That's right. Amen. But he loves the person. Right. Right. And if we, right here, inordinate affections, if we lust after something that the word of God says is not proper and not right, it is sin. Amen. Right. I don't care if it's the same sex or not the same sex. I don't care if you can, you can lust after a lot more than a person. Right. You can lust after power. You can lust after money. You can lust after many different things. He says, inordinate affections. 
It's a corpse. It's dead. Evil conspicuousness, meaning anything that is bad, harmful, wicked, or a depraved longing. Covetousness, greed. Which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. I want to say this. If we are living in a place where we are, we are not believing in the Lord, the wrath of God is already upon those children of disobedience. Yeah. You could say, well, that's horrible. But he's made a way. Yeah. He's given you a free will yeah. so that you can receive the born-again experience. <laughs> and what he says is the wrath of God rests upon those that are children of disobedience. That does not mean that if you were born again and you mess up, that he doesn't give you a way of escape. He's talking about when you don't receive salvation. And he said, look, all these things mortify. Count them as a corpse. It is dead to you. Fornication, dead. Uncleanness, dead. Inordinate affections, dead. Yeah. And then he continues to go on and say this. In that which you also walked some time. When you lived in them. Look, I don't want to dig up your past, and I'm not going to. But we lived in this place. And what that word live means, means to dwell, means to rest, means a, a manner in which we stay. Those are the things in which we desire to go after. But God said, look, I don't want you. I know that you did. And I know. I've seen it. I know you did it. But I don't want you to live there. There's a difference between a man or a woman that chooses to live in that place. Versus a man or a woman that wants changed from God but is walking through the process of sanctification, of being changed, and messes up and gets back up and believes again. God will always work with a believer that wants and desires change. But if we want to live there, he's going to let it get a hold of us until we decide to repent. Come on, sister. <clears throat> and I am not preaching at you. I am living this with you. Come on. Colossians 3, 8 says, but now you. Hallelujah. He didn't say now your neighbor. Because <laughs> you know we like to hear sermons and be like, oh, did you hear that? He got her. <laughs> I'm so glad she was here this morning. Did she hear that? You already wrong. You wrong just for saying that. What was the Holy Ghost saying to you this morning? Oh God, let us look at ourselves in the mirror. He said, but now you. That means you got these things. Put off anger. Wrath. Malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. <clears throat> Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man and his deeds. That word put off means divest oneself to. And I was like, what's that word divest mean? Because, you know, I need Webster sometimes. And that, that word means Deprive the power and rights of. Right? I was like, glory to God. The cross has deprived the rights and power of these things that can take a hold of our lives. And he said, no more. It has been canceled. There is no power. The enemy has no rights over our lives. Try to 
stay right there. But I want to experience. Come on, sister. Yeah. I want to experience when anger tries to get a hold of look. I got a temper. <laughs> Pastor Matt, don't laugh. <laughs> when that starts rising up in my heart, and I, I say this all hell begins to break loose in my mind, and I just want to spew it all out. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Unless y'all sprout angel wings. <laughs> God, let me put that off. Oh, yes. It has no rights over yes. my life oh, any longer. Yeah. It has no power over my life any longer. I don't care what he did. I don't care what she did. I don't care what your boss did. I don't know. Help me. But now you, you put it off. Because God wants us to live in freedom. Freedom. When we put the filthy communication, when we put those things off, has no right any longer. We begin to live in the divine nature of Jesus Christ. You no longer have to fun function nor practice those things. Amen. Whatever your thing is, because your thing probably not my thing and my thing's not your thing. But whatever your thing is, God is saying you no longer have to practice that. It doesn't have to be where you live. Amen. Romans 6, 7 says this. For he that is dead is free from sin. Dead means you're dead. But I'm living. But I'm alive. But you're dead. You are dead in the mind of God because when you gave your heart to the Lord, the Holy Spirit took you and placed you into Christ. And the mind of God, he sees Jesus dead on the cross paying the penalty for your sin being buried and it wiped away like my mama burning up those pictures and being raised to new life yeah. in Christ. Yeah. If you are sick of hearing this, I suggest we check our hearts. Yeah. Because that's what, this is what we need yeah. to live in this yeah. world. Yeah. I am dead to that thing. I am freed from sin. Why? Because Christ broke the power of it yeah. over my Look, I'm not putting my business up on that 
board, then expose us, and my business ain't none of your business, and your business ain't none of my business. But it's the Lord's business. But he wants to take care of our business. Clean up our mess. And he said this, he said, Romans 6, 8, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. It's like, look, I'm not going to leave you dead. It doesn't stop at dead and buried. It stops at, I want to raise you up into new life. I want to give you new ways of living. I want to give you new ways of thinking. I want to give you new practices and new ways of speaking and new ways of dressing and new attitudes. When you used to have an attitude with your boss the week before, now all of a sudden you're like, hey. And it's genuine. It's not fake until you make it. God actually wants to do a deep work inside of us. He says, I will also give you new life. John 10.10 10 says the thief cometh but to kill, steal, and destroy. That old man, look, if we want to live there, that's all he does. That's all the enemy does. That's all our flesh does. That old way of life, what we listed in Colossians, will steal, kill, and destroy. And it's your choice, and it's my choice if I choose to live there. Because he said, but now you mortify. You choose. And look, there's been times in my Christian walk where I didn't even really realize what I was doing. I was, I had, I could apply the truth of God's word in faith to my life. But you ever get caught up in something so much that you just end up living there anyway? Yeah. And if you didn't, you will experience it one day. Because God wants it, he wants us to take what he has done and apply it every day to our lives. Christ, uh, Paul says, I died daily. That doesn't mean every day he was dying. It means every day he was choosing to mortify, to count it as dead, his old way of life. Yes. And provided on Calvary, Jesus said, I come that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. Romans 6, 9 says, Knowing this, that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death has no more dominion over him. That means that what used to rule and reign in your life no longer has power over you. If suicidal thoughts was something that you deal with, it no longer has power over you. If drug addiction is something that we struggle with, it no longer has power over you. If grief has totally swallowed you up, it no longer has power over you. If the devil has said, I've got your children and I'm going to keep them, it no longer has power over you. You have the right to prophesy life over your children. No longer has power over you. Based on your relationship with Jesus Christ, sin has no more power over you. Romans 6, 10. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. What he is saying here is yield ourselves to the working of the Holy Spirit. If you listen, I mean listen, it's not audible. If you listen, you get in your word and you read it. If you listen to the words of the songs that are being sung, you play worship music, anointed worship music. Fill yourself with his presence. He, the Lord will speak to you. I don't know how many times, I don't know if I told this story in here, but I used to be a really bad liar, like really bad. I would try to tell you that the sky was red, and I would like be believing that I was going to make you believe that the sky was red. And I remember when the Lord started working on that. Nia and I had just became friends. And I would tell her something that was a lie. 
Like I would lie so much that lying became normal. Like I would just lie. So I, I would, but then the Lord started pricking that area of my heart. And I would go back to her and I'd be like, I'd be, it would be humiliating. And I'd be like, swallow my pride. Naya lied, lied about that. And at first she was shocked. But then it got so reoccurring <laughs> that she's like, okay, I love you, I forgive you. But then the line stopped. Amen. Because God was chipping away at that thing. Lying might not have been your thing, but that was my thing. And because as an addict, you lie all the time. That's what you do. So, and then eventually I was just free. And now, if any, look, don't act like we're more holy than now. Because if anything want to come out my mouth that even resembles a white lie or a misinterpretation or anything like that, Holy Ghost, just like, stop right there before it even comes out your mouth. Because it would be a lie. Yeah. It would be a lie. So God begins to work on them. Now that might not have been your thing, but God begins to chip at those things as we yield ourselves to him. God, that thing is right there again. God, you see I'm greedy over this. God, you see I keep cheating at this. God, you see I'm lusting over this. God, you see I want this and it's not what your word says is right and good for, my, for me. God, you see I can't stop watching this. God, you see, I can't stop speaking this. God, you see, my heart is bitter towards this situation. God, you see, and you yield it, and you give it. Look, this is practical Christianity. See, so many times we come to church, and we're just like, woo, yeah, great service. But then you walk out there, and you have a world to face. God wants to equip us. For everyday life in Christ. Amen. Not just so you could have the goosebumps on Sunday. Come on, come on. And be crying at the altar on Wednesday. But so you can experience his presence every day. And experience freedom from these things every day. You ever come to the altar and lay something there? And then, and you feel, oh God, I'm free of that. <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> and then you walk out that door, that thing standing you right in the face. Yeah. Yeah. But you, that, that's when you say, okay, I am dead to that thing. Oh, that thing is yeah. dead by the blood of yeah. Jesus Christ. It has no power over yeah. me. Then you go home, open up your door, there that thing is again. I am dead. Yes, it is yes. dead. And it has no power Hallelujah. over me any longer. Hallelujah. It could take us years. Some things take years to stop. I'll tell you one thing still tries to get me. Smoking cigarettes. Look, once again, angels. <laughs> Every single time I smell a cigarette, the devil tries to say, oh, he does See, he know he can't get me with the hard stuff. So he wants to try to get me to go back to old ways of life by the littler stuff. And now I'm dead to that. I am dead to that. That no longer has power over me. That, that, that way of life, looking like that, being like that, acting like that, talking like that, walking like that, thinking like that, no longer has power over me. By the blood of Jesus Christ. Look, I don't know about you, but this makes me excited. Hallelujah. He said.
here comes that temper. Oh, that's got to go. Take inventory. Allow God to take inventory of our hearts. He will set you free. Jesus said, verily, verily, John 3, 3. I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's a must. He goes on to say this. Nicodemus says this. How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus said to him, how is a man able to be generated old? Be made new old, that means. He is not able to enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born again. Nicodemus was speaking in the realm of the flesh, but Jesus was speaking in the realm of the spirit. That word, a second time, means the first time. Well, let me continue to go on. Jesus says this, verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man to be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. He is saying this again emphatically. You must be born again. He is speaking of water as in the natural birth, the amniotic sac, the natural birth. You must be born once, okay? After you're born once, okay, you're born. That doesn't automatically make you a candidate to go to heaven. That doesn't automatically make you a candidate to be right with God. He's saying, if you want to be right with God, you must be born a second time. Born of the Spirit. Born again. You must be born again. He says, marvel not, I said unto thee, you must be born again in verse 7. You must means there's no shadow of a doubt. You must bind yourself to Jesus Christ. He is the only way. For God so loved the world. Now if you would come up. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him. Should not perish. But have everlasting life. Whosoever. That means me and you. Generation after generation. I want to say this, whosoever means that anyone can be saved. That's right. That blows the Calvinistic view of predestination out of the water. Right, right. No one is predestined to go to heaven and to go to hell. The Bible says whosoever will come. Whosoever thirsts come. Whosoever needs come. The spirit of the bride says come. His desire of us is that we not perish. That we not be destroyed, but that we have eternal life in Jesus Christ. So if you would stand with me this morning. I want to encourage you that that scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I pray to God that God has unlocked a new meaning of that scripture this morning. And if you're in this house this morning. And you have heard over and over again, you must be born again. You must be born again. And you're not sure if you're right with God. You're not sure if you're born again. You're not, you're not sure. I pray that you would come to the altar so we could pray with you. Because my word says you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. That's right. And also, if you've heard this morning and you want to renew your relationship with the Lord. Yes. You feel like some of these things that we discussed this morning has been taken hold of you. And you want God to make it real in your heart that you have a new power source and that you are dead to those things. You want to renew your vow to him, so to say. God, I want to live for you. I invite you to come to the altar as well. And the altar is not a scary place. It's just a place to say, I heard you, Lord, and I believe you. I heard you, and I believe you, and I ask you to touch me. Yes. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You unravel me Thank you, Lord. with a melody. Thank you, Jesus. you surround me. Thank you, Lord.
Miami. 